So our next speaker is uh, Maria Mercedes Roca, coming to, to us from the Zamorano Institute in Honduras. Um, she has a background in plant pathology and virology um, and spends a lot of her time uh, developing curriculum for students. Um, she also serves on the Honduran government on uh, biotechnology uh, regulation and in particular is interested in biosafety of synthetic biology, which fits with her title of synthetic biology and bioenergy, helping the good guys and stopping the bad. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eddie, and the organizers for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'll be teaching a microbiology class in the fall, so I'm learning a lot from you, and I'm sure my students will appreciate the, the great advances in, in these wonderful sciences that, uh, that you're doing. Um, I will start by um, telling you a little bit about my talk so you understand, and I'll tell you why I picked the, the title. Um, I think it's very important that we understand the context of why we need to do this weird science. I'm talking about synthetic biology, programming new genomes, making bacteria do interesting new things which scare some people. We need to understand the, the, the context and why our food and energy and the environment and all these things are so linked. Uh, then I want to share a couple of stories with you, some of the things that I work with as a, as a tropical plant pathologist, some of the problems that uh, you may not be aware we had for almost 100 years, and we're not using modern science to, to, to tackle these problems, so maybe I will be able to inspire some of the young people to use the, the new wonderful tools to tackle some uh, very, very old problems that are still plaguing us. Then I'll, um, I'll continue with the bottleneck, which is the regulation. I am one of a generation of scientists. I trained in molecular biologists in the 80s, and I haven't been able to use any of these tools of molecular biology uh, for uh, the, the science that I studied, which is plant pathology, and I'll share some stories with that as well. And then I'll finish with uh, probably my favorite subject, which is how uh, we can bring the tools of the 21st century to uh, engage our young people in education. And I'll be talking a little bit about iGEM. And I don't know if, uh, if many of you have heard about iGEM, but it's one of my favorite things at the moment. So I'll start by um, telling you a little bit about myself. If I say something irreverent, I want you to forgive me. Uh, like synthetic biology, I'm a hybrid. I was born in Colombia, lived in Bolivia, I was educated in the UK, uh, so I'm a hybrid of cultures. So I understand the European culture, I have lived there, I married a Brit, I have lived in Honduras for the last 16 years, so I do live in a poor country, and I have gained the perspective of living in a poor country. And poor countries, I will say this, are not just where poor people live, all kinds of people live in poor countries, rich people, multinationals, industry, they produce the bananas that you so like, the coffee that you drink every day, the chocolate uh, that is made so beautifully in Europe. All these things are made in poor countries. Um, so if I say something irreverent, you will forgive me because I will say so in the spirit of doing something different, breaking paradigms. So I'll start by the the context, I think we've all heard about the perfect storm. We're, gonna, we're exploding in population. We're going to have 9 billion people by 2050. We have to produce more biomass with less water, with uh, climate change. With... And I think we hear this so often that we, we get some kind of bad news fatigue. We become insensitive to the bad news, and we say, there's not a lot we can do, so yeah, I'm very sympathetic, but I'll just get on with life, and uh, we tend to forget about it. And uh, this is Honduras. It's kind of easy to forget that there's climate change. I would invite any of you to visit me, to visit the beautiful Mayan ruins and the beautiful Caribbean beaches, and you think, climate change? Where's the climate change? It's so lovely up there in the Caribbean beaches. And then food. Is there really not enough food when wherever I go to the supermarket, there's all these wonderful things from every corner of the globe in every season? I can get strawberries or bananas or chocolate or coffee. 
I don't even know when they grow, which season they grow. I can get everything in the supermarkets in the West and in the supermarkets in poor countries. So for wealthy people, the ones like us that have well-fed bellies, where is this food shortage? And I put a picture of bananas because I'll be talking about bananas anymore. Please bear with me and remember the shape of those bananas. They're very beautiful, they're very uniform. They don't have any black specks. They, they're all the same size because that's what the supermarkets demand of the growers. It has huge implications to conform to those standards and I'll be talking about that later. So I was talking to you about this fatigue of bad news. So yesterday when I was getting ready uh, to polish my presentation, I got the Wall Street Journal. Look at the, the date, March 18th. And, the, and the, the, the headline, food prices surges as drought extract a high toll. So bit by bit, every day the news reminds us climate change is upon us. We are actually um, experiencing the problems that we've created as humans. Surging prices for food, staples for coffee, to meat, to vegetables. And I put a, an arrow on coffee. It's not the drought, it's actually the excess rain in Central America. It's been raining more than usual, so diseases like coffee rust are exploding. And they are having a huge effect on the crop and of course on the economy of the country. Uh, food prices will rise in the U.S. by 3.5% this year. So if you belong to an affluent society where maybe between 5 or 10% of your household income is spent on food, you won't feel it. It's just a little bit more expensive. Housewives may talk about this in a coffee uh, break with a friend. But if you're from a developing country and you spend 70 or 80% of your income on food, you will feel this pinch. So this is just to exemplify that in little ways and big ways, we are suffering already the effects of what we've done. So I started talking about the good guys and the bad guys. Well, we're all the bad guys because we're all causing climate change and I think none of us can deny that we all have a, a carbon print. And here in the US, for, for example, the average American uses 22 times more energy than the average Honduran. I probably use as much energy as the average American because I drive a car. I come here in this meeting by an airplane. I use air conditioning. Uh, so we're all to blame, especially if you were in New York in, during Sunday. Uh, and somebody said a, in an earlier presentation, about, talking about bacteria, what happens in one bacterial cell? has implications in all the population. Well, it's the same with humans. What a group of humans do in one place has effects and consequences everywhere. What the Brits, what the Europeans think about GMOs have implications in how we regulate GMOs everywhere. And I'll be talking about later. So we are all the bad guys. And I think my message is we, the scientists, especially you, the, the great scientists, of this world, you can be the good guys. You can actually use your wonderful science to engage, to solve the many, many problems that we are uh, we're, we're facing. So we, we can say, well, the, let the politicians deal with that. And in fact, they did in the Rio Plus 20, this, uh, this very important sustainable summit that they had in Brazil in 2012. Uh, I was very privileged to have been invited by the Honduran government, by the minister, as the agricultural expert of our delegation. And they came up with this wonderful document called The Future We Want, where all the countries, I think about 120 heads of state, came to that meeting. They all arrived in helicopters. And they tried to get together. Uh, uh, they tried to agree on what the planet needed. And guess what happened? Of course, they didn't agree. It was very nice. The biggest gathering of heads of state I think the world has ever seen. And every country pulled their own way, looking after their interests. And so it was held as a complete disaster. You know, they 
the, the newspapers and especially the NGOs. But I actually got a lot of, out of it, especially three things. There were a lot of side events for the, for the science. So business, as usual, is not an option. Let us face the challenges with more technology, and this is what we do, scientists develop technology, and less ideology, that these things are not natural, GMOs are not natural, so let's not use them because they might be dangerous. And uh, the last one, the time to act is now. We really are running out of time. So let's stop being the bad guys and turn ourselves into the good guys. So if, uh, if we um, start talking about specifics now and talk about energy, I think we all agree that we cannot separate energy from, uh, from food. We need food as humans to survive, and we need energy to produce that food and to do all the things that we, we do. So there is a triangle. Energy, food, the environment, is in, they are intricately um, mixed. So I take this from a, a good uh, friend and mentor of mine, Lilin, who talks, uh, uh, works a lot in bioenergy. And he has two questions. Can we produce bioenergy at a very large scale? What very large scale? Because there's so many of us on the planet. Without sacrificing other important priorities, like the environment. And the second question, must we do so? in order to have reasonable expectations of achieving a sustainable world. And then he come, he has produced something that I find very useful for uh, talking uh, about this with my students. If we think about the three main, let's call it revolutions that we have uh, in, in humanity, so we, we were cavemen at some point, hunter and gatherers, and then we domesticated animals and plants and we invented agriculture, but there were very few of us at the time. And it took millennia to go through that transition. Then we advanced and we, um, we came to the Industrial Revolution and the population of the world exploded. And then we started doing things really unsustainably and reproducing crazily, madly, to the point where we are now. And so many people, or I should say some, not many, and this is where I'm going to say some irreverent things. They would like to go, us, society, the world, to go back to Victorian times, to all be farmers and not use pesticides and fertilizers and, and do everything organic like we did 200 years ago. I think it might be possible if we were a third of the people that we are today, but because we are so many and we are global, our world is flat now, well, it's of course round, but we're all connected, so we call it flat again. We need to have industrialized, what, what he calls sustainable industrial agriculture. So it's not everybody living in a little farm doing uh, organic agriculture, but we need to do it at an industrial scale, but in a sustainable revolution. And this is where the third revolution will come. So uh, Lee comes up with this very interesting idea. He says, let's not extrapolate the problems of the future with current technology. He invites us, and I invite you to look at the future, to close our eyes and to think of a different future, to visualize a future, and visualize a future with different technologies. How we're going to get to this future with different technologies, the technologies that you are helping to develop right now and how we mustn't extrapolate. And uh, I came across a wonderful example when I was in London in this synthetic biology meeting outside the Science Museum. There was a poster of how in Victorian times everybody used carriages, horse carriages, and London uh, had tons and tons of horse manure dumped today. Imagine if we extrapolated how the world would transport with all these seven million billions that we have with horses, will be inundated with literally horse manure. And we know that that didn't happen. So we need to extrapolate, intrapolate the future. So that's a, a word that he coined, intrapolate the future with new technology. So um, how do we do this? Well, of course, you are all the, the experts who are learning how to enhance organisms, microorganisms, with genetic engineering, with synthetic biology. And we're also learning how to enhance crops and feedstocks. So that is, I guess, your job. 
Uh, and I think you are doing a wonderful job of how uh, to do this. Uh, but let me uh, then stop for a little bit and let's have a reality check how we are advancing or maybe not. I'll uh, talk about some other bad guys. So we talk about the bad guys. We as humans can be the bad guys living our carbon print. The bad guys, of course, are the pathogens that uh, we are still trying to manage and we're not doing a very good job. So let me share a couple of stories that I work with about these bad guys. Climate change, where's climate change? A beautiful beach in the Caribbean. And uh, what this Richard Branson and I have in common, well, we like coconuts. We like coconuts and from coconuts you can make biofuels. You can make biodiesel to put on airplanes. So there's him taking his piña colada. I work with coconuts in Honduras. In fact, that was the reason that I ended up in Honduras. And this is a picture I took in a, on a beach in 2000, and, in 2000. And this is the same beach three years later after it got hit by a disease called coconut lethal yellowing that killed 90%, 95% of the coconut in Honduras. And um, it's wonderful for me because I, I worked on this project for about 10 years and we've learned so much about the genome of the mycoplasm. We know how to um, do very, very sophisticated detection with PCR and real-time PCR when we set up real-time PCR and we set up, we, we train students and I've gone all over the Caribbean and Mexico and Africa, I'll show you later. And the only way we know how to manage it is by injecting antibiotics on the palm, which is not very good, or by cutting the, the, uh, the palms. So I went to Mozambique, had to go to Mozambique in, in December. They have a huge problem there and the US spent $20 million of the Millennium Challenge account to manage this disease. And you know what they had to do? Cut the palm. That's all they did. And that, that wouldn't even take care of the, of the problem. It was to stop the rhinoceros beetle that grows in the, the dead trunks. So this is just to show you that we're not making any progress. There's a couple of other stories, oil palm, that is very popular and growing and doing a lot of environmental damage, by the way. It has diseases like this one called uh, bat rot by Phytophthora, and it has to be managed by chemical pesticides. Then who doesn't enjoy a coffee, uh, whether it's decaf, or, but we are now, I shared with you, uh, we have this new disease, no, it's not new disease, a new uh, focus of the disease is uh, a hundred year old disease is called coffee rust and it's really bringing the economy of Central America down to its knees. Another one, the black cigatoka. About 14 years ago, uh, a company, and I really don't have anything against the multinationals. They produce some very good science. They came up with a, a GM banana against cigatoka. They stop the project, they, want, they tested it in Honduras. It actually worked, but the market in, in Europe was not ready. And that's, the market. that's how they make the money. People in Europe were not ready to eat GM bananas. They hated the thought. So we continue business as usual, spraying pesticides in airplanes. And people live in villages in those big banana plantations. Children go to school. They told me that they're nice. They spray the pesticides in the evening. And I thought, oh. At least they're concerned about the children. No, no, it's the, the pesticides work better at lower temperatures. So they spray early in the morning and late at night, so the pesticides work better. Never mind about the children that live there. And I wonder how many people, when you go to the supermarket and you want your bananas that are GM free, know about this thing. You probably don't spare a second thought to this. Um, another story close to my heart. Kelly is going to be telling you much more about it. Dengue, so dengue is a really, really nasty thing, but most of you will uh, never experience it, thank God. They have, uh, Oxitec has uh, produced a GM mosquito that Kelly will tell you more about it. But 
know uh, the activists have already started rejecting it. We don't want GM mosquitoes. And this is a story we hear again and again. And here I want to share a picture. This is actually my house in Honduras. And every year we have to get sprayed by this. This, uh, last week it was when they came, this was last year, but last week I was sick because I had not been feeling well. And they told me that they were going to spray my house. I had to flee my house and I had to go and find and my dogs and, and my kids. And we had to go and leave the house for half a day because they had to do this. And we had to do it because getting dengue is a really, really nasty thing. So bottom of the story, it's really easy to reject something when it doesn't affect you. And it's very nice and easy to reject something when you're in a temperate country in Europe, well fed. And these things don't affect you and say, I don't want any GMO. I don't want any GM mosquitoes. Because you don't get the airplanes flying uh, above your house with the pesticides, or you don't get dengue. So the bottleneck, and I'm coming towards the end, helping the good guys. So I will now, I talked about the bad guys being us and climate change and all that, and the bad guys being the pathogens, and the good guys being the scientists that do such amazing job. Now I'm going to go back to the bad guys. And you will forgive me, and I don't think there's any in this audience, so I, I can kind of um, afford to say it freely. The bad guys that want to stop the scientists doing the good job, especially the ones that are going to stop the new generation of synthetic biologists, of the new students that are uh, engaged in this and can bring solutions. And this is really the bottleneck. So let me, um, share with you my concern. Do you, I, I think all of you must have, must know a lot about the GMO regulation, agricultural biotechnology. Are we going to repeat the same problems with synthetic biology? I'd like to be hopeful and say, no, we've learned from our mistakes, but right now today I'm kind of not so hopeful, but maybe. Uh, there are good news along the way. This, just, this map just shows me very clearly. Um, this is the distribution of population growth in the world. Just look at Asia, 49% in 2050. Africa, 41%. We're a little better in the Americas, 37%, 35%. The US, you're doing fine, 4%. And Europe, please look at Europe. It's minus 1%. And yet, somehow, the legislation in Europe, the policy, the agricultural policy in Europe is driving what's happening in the agricultural policy in Africa, in Asia, in Central America. And you may say, well, you see, countries are sovereign to decide. Well, not so, because what happens in one place has consequences in other. We listen to what's happening in the US, to what's happening in Europe. And we think, well, if they don't want it, maybe it's because it's really bad. If they ban it, it really must be dangerous. So we must do the same. Also, they give us money. They give us aid. And this aid comes with all kinds of strings attached. You accept aid, like when you accept money from your parents, you have to do what they say. Or when you accept money from the bank, you have to accept their conditions. You accept money from the rich countries, from Europe, and you have to abide by the rules. And they say, no GMOs. And don't you dare to produce anything with this technology, because we won't buy it. And OK, you can produce it if you want, but we won't buy it. So if you want to enter markets, and you want to make profits, and there's nothing wrong with making profits, right? It's not a dirty word. Everybody needs to make a profit for a living. So this uh, is creating a huge problem. I don't know how many of you are aware that there are international treaties, like there is the Cartagena, the Kyoto Protocol. We have the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety of Biotechnology. And you in the US may not know about this too much because the US never signed the Cartagena Protocol. But all the other countries, the European countries and the most countries, 121 countries, have signed the Cartagena Protocol, which means that you have to abide the rules. And to the Spanish gentleman, you know that the Cartagena Protocol is driven by European politics. 
uh, many, many people that drive the discussions of the Cartagena Protocol uh, are actually uh, from the EU. And what is really popular, they, we, they invoke the precautionary principle or the pre precautionary approach. To many of us, this is what the precautionary approach looks uh, like. Okay, your bike may, may get stolen. Fair enough. It's dangerous. There's a lot of fears about it. Come on. Don't overkill it. Don't overdo it. Or maybe you are the one that is making the locks. So once one of my students said once, well, this is not so bad if you're the one that is making the locks, right? So it's in your best interest to put so many locks in the bikes. But uh, of a precautionary policy really has an effect on innovation, on technology. Uh, I once started a project with a transgenic tomato. Um, I had collaborations with really good US universities, but my president said to me, well, are you going to, have any of you got any idea how much it costs to bring a product to application in terms of costs? It's about $50 million. It may cost you five or 10 to produce it, and 50 to prove that it's safe. So none of us, none of us in the public institutions can afford to do this. So the technology is squarely with the big industry, with Monsanto, with Syngenta, with Dow Agrochemicals, and all our public universities are completely out of the way uh, of the game. Hopefully, this will change with uh, synthetic biology. And uh, so I'm going to talk a, a, a little bit about this. And this is uh, a subject that is very close to my heart because maybe biotechnology kind of evolved, got married, and got married to the engineers. And then the offspring of biotechnology is synthetic biology. It's not just the molecular biologists. It's the engineers. It's the bioinformatics. It's all kinds of people bringing together sciences and it has had two wonderful effects. It has democratized a technology that was just for the big companies and the big important universities. And just like uh, the internet in the 70s in this place in California became the realms of young people that could write programs and write applications, that is happening with synthetic biology. And I don't know how many of you have come across this iGEM idea. It stands for International Genetic Engineering Machine. It was the brainchild of a bunch of people in, in MIT, and now they're all over in Stanford. Drew Endy uh, started this. It's a competition. It's a synthetic biology competition for young people, strictly for undergraduates. There were about a four or five a teams in 2003. Ten years later, there's 180 teams from all over the globe, and two categories undergraduates and high school kids. So these kids are doing synthetic biology, tinkering with uh, bacteria, putting genes, and doing uh, exciting things. This is uh, the team that I am coaching. And it says in Spanish, Honduras and Mexico, because uh, the team I'm coaching comes from the, the kids from Mexico and from Honduras, and telecommunications allow this. And they, they wrote, we are in nappies, in diapers. But the good news is that we have been born already. So the, the students are excited. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a, a relationship with uh, Stanford. And uh, so Paul Jaschke, a very, very bright molecular biologist, came and helped us develop a, a biosensor. It's a proof of concept of bacteria glowing green and orange. And the students really understand it about genetic transformation and that it's possible to do. And just before I finish, I'd like to share this cartoon with you, give it a, a few seconds to read that is nothing new that scares people, new things. So the guy says, you should not tamper with the forces of nature when somebody was inventing fire. And this is something that we are going to have to deal with. The unknown, what the public fears, the public doesn't know, doesn't understand, this, and they're going to resist us. They're going to resist the scientists developing this. And what do we do? Well, I wish I had the answer, but uh, uh, here is an invitation for scientists to get more engaged in explaining this uh, science to the public. 
to come out of your lab and spend a little time, like Anne is doing with the kids, uh, with the school children, explain it in lay terms so they can understand and show people that we are the good guys. We don't, okay, there, are, there might be terrorists wanting to blow up uh, the world and making uh, um, weapons of mass destruction using this technology, but I think there are the very, very mi minority, just a few bad guys. The majority are you, the good guys. So I will finish with this. Uh, a few conclusions. We need appropriate regulations. We cannot get away with not having regulations, but they have to be uh, based on risk, on scientifically defensible risk assessment. No, I think it's not an opinion. Uh, we are in a globalized society. What happens in the US, what you decide in the US, what you decide in Europe is going to have an effect in other countries. And uh, well, Basically, we are in this together. We're on the same boat, and this is a photograph of my university in Honduras, and thank you so much for your time. Are there any quick questions? Not very much, Anne. I don't think people, people talk about it, but money, projects, workshops on not doing anything, on keeping the status quo, not very much. So that's an excellent question, not very much. Okay, well Maria's up here if people have other questions. I think for the sake of time, we will stop and come back at 3.30.